this be one of the best moments of your life. You're listening to the Business Mirror Podcast for a broader look on business with Senior Editor Dennis Estopase. Good day, I'm Dennis Estopase, and our topic for today is the Universal Health Care Law. There are two journalists behind the story on the Universal Health Care Law, Business Mirror Samuel Medinilla and Kai Ordinario. For the text version, please go to www.businessmirror.com.ph and search for Universal Health Care Law, No Grand Cure to What's Ailing the Philippine Health Sector. The story of the title was published in the broader look section of the Business Mirror newspaper on July 11, 2019. Let's get on with the story. Nearly 140 days after President Duterte signed into law the Universal Health Care Act, its Implementing Rules and Regulations, or IRR, has yet to be finalized, and almost every stakeholder waits with bated breath. Labor groups are one of these stakeholders, as their demand for the regularization of thousands of contractual workers received an unexpected shot in the arm with the implementation of the Universal Health Care Law, or Republic Act 11223. To note the law and its IRR come at a time when a study released through a private company believes medical and health care are becoming expensive, especially for poor Filipinos. But Public Services Labor Independent Confederation, or PS Link Advocacy Head, Gillian Roque said they are now eagerly awaiting the law's IRR, particularly on its provision on regularization of medical workers. Roque is referring to Section 23 of the Universal Health Care Law, which states to ensure continuity in the provision of health programs and services, all health professionals and health care workers shall be guaranteed permanent employment and competitive salaries. Roque told the Business Mirror in an interview they didn't know how this provision made it to the law, but she said they considered the inclusion of that provision as a big victory for medical workers. Roque explained they will use the provision to demand for the regularization of public sector employees who are not given regular status. Federation of Free Workers Vice President Julius Kenglet said they will also use the provision to make a similar push in the private sector. It implies that the provision for permanent employment and competitive salaries applies indeed to all healthcare professionals and workers. Labor groups will definitely invoke this together with the presidential directive to end contractualization. For their part, Private Hospitals Association of the Philippines or PHAP President Dr. Rustico Jimenez told the Business Mirror that PHAP will be seeking a clarification from the Department of Health if the said provision will also apply to the private sector. Jimenez said they will comply with whatever decision of the Department of Health on the issue. The 2016 data of the Philippine Statistics Authority showed that out of the nearly 138,000 workers in the private health and social work activities industries with 20 or more workers, only about 19,500 were non-regular. Of these non-regular workers, about 11,188, or 57.3%, have a probationary status. About 4,000 casual workers and 3,700 contractual workers make up about 20% each of the employees in the said category. The remaining 3% of those employed in the said category are seasonal workers or apprentices. Efforts by the labor sector to maximize the use of the universal health care law in their anti-contractualization campaign, particularly in the private sector, may face legal question. Quezon 4th District Representative Angelina Tan, one of the sponsors of the UHC law at the lower house, said their intention when they approved the said provision was to regularize the large number of job orders in government medical facilities. We were only talking about the government setup. Tan told the Business Mirror on June 18, during the first leg of the DOH public consultation in Metro Manila for the crafting of the IRR for the Universal Health Care Law. Labor Assistant Secretary Benjo Benavides agreed with Tan, stating the provision is also limited to the public sector due to its wording. It used the term permanent employment, which is a jargon of the civil service. For the private sector, its counterpart is regular employment. Furthermore, the labor official said the constitutionality of the universal health care law provision may also be put into question if it is applied to the private sector. It may be found unconstitutional in a sense because you cannot mandate permanent employment because we have the Labor Code of the Philippines. Under the Labor Code, we have provisionary, regular, seasonal, and project-based employment.
Based on the current draft of the UHC Laws IRR, the Department of Health, in consultation with the Department of Budget and Management, is tasked to progressively raise the number of permanent workers in government medical facilities. It also states all health workers to be hired in priority areas must be given permanent positions. DOH licensed private medical facilities are merely encouraged by the IRR to hire a certain number of healthcare workers with competitive salaries determined by the government's health department. Health Undersecretary Mario Villaverde explained the provision for the private sector is currently an aspiration to ensure it will not interrupt with their operation. Of course, we consider the survival of the private sector medical facilities, how they could maintain the sustainability of their operation because they also have to have some return of investment. If they close down, we will lose more health services. It is one factor that can improve the quality of our medical services. Villaverde, the lead DOH official in charge for communicating the UHC law, said they hope the private medical facilities will eventually regularize all their employees. But even if the provision of the UHC law for regularizing workers is currently limited to the public sector, it is still expected to benefit thousands of workers with non-regular employment arrangement. Citing data from the Philippine Statistics Authority, the Bureau of Local Employment Director Dominic Tutay said, the number of workers under human health and social work activities has been slowly increasing. The number of workers under human health and social work activities steadily increased from 438,000 in 2012 to 502,000 in 2016. Their number dropped to 484,000 in 2017 before recovering to 517,000 in 2018. Tutai said these numbers include both regular and contractual workers, but it should be noted that the number includes social workers. Separate data sets sourced from the Department of Health and the Philippine Statistics Authority specifically showed the number of government doctors, nurses, dentists, and midwives also increased since 2012. That year, the total number of government medical workers was composed of the following, about 2,900 doctors, 2,072 dentists, about 5,300 nurses, and 17,500 midwives. These figures improved in 2016. The latest da available data from the PSA showed to 3,177 doctors, 1,953 dentists, 6,009 nurses, and 17,200 midwives. Health Secretary Mario Villaverde admitted that, as it is, there is still a shortage in the number of medical workers to sufficiently provide for the medical services to the country's rising number of population. He noted that the current ratio for public doctors is 1 to 20,000, which is the same ratio for nurses. Villaverde said for midwives, the ratio is 1 is to 5,000. That is not enough, according to Villaverde. As of September 30, 2018, the Professional Regulation Commission has registered about 141,000 doctors, 905,000 nurses, and nearly 177,000 midwives. The prevailing lack in manpower leads to unhealthy working conditions for medical workers. Among them is a nurse who spoke to Business Mirror on the condition of anonymity as she works at the Philippine General Hospital for at least five years now. The 28-year-old nurse shared how they would usually be serving 10 to 20 patients per day, which is more than the ideal 4 to 5 patients per nurse. Even if we lack nurses in medicine, we still have to admit every patient as the PGH is the end referral hospital in the country. You can go to private hospitals, but if you no longer have enough funds, your end point is PGH. Because of this, we can't provide the quality of care that we would have wanted to give to our patients. We really need help on this. The condition of nurses like her also takes its toll on their health, making them prone to burnout and even to different kinds of disease. Health Undersecretary Mario Villaverde is hoping the shortage in workforce would be finally addressed by the provision in the UHC law that allows institutions to hire more medical workers. However, rather than just relying on population alone, he said they have partnered with the United States Agency for International Development, or USAID, to find out other salient factors to more accurately determine the number of additional medical practitioners they will need. Among the factors they are considering is the workload of the employees, as well as the terrain where they are deployed. He said that also included in their plan reform is to update their existing ratio of medical workers per population.
We are studying how we could update our standards. I think this is no longer enough since we have more programs compared to the 1980s when we first set the said standard. Finally, Villaverde said they are also looking at how they could address the insufficient number of medical professionals available in the local labor force by offering scholarships to qualified students with a three-year return service contract. During the public consultation on the UHC law, Villaverde said they plan to make the scholarship more attractive by developing it into a program wherein participants could get a master's degree and even career opportunity in the Department of Health. William Verde cited their pending two-track program for doctor scholars, wherein they could either choose to become a doctor to the barrio and get a master's degree in public administration, or pick an academic track and take the medical specialization to be determined by the Department of Health. Tutai emphasized the importance of increasing the number of professional medical workers amid their increasing demand. There is really a need for more workers in the health sector because of our increasing population. And then, second, you have to serve both the overseas and the local market. Until the government could hire additional medical workers, the DOH said it will have to tap the private sector to help in implementing the universal health care law. But Dr. Oscar Tino expressed concern over the IRR of the UHC law. Tino claims the law's provision on the role of the private sector remains vague. The IRR should be clear on the role of the private sector physicians, and clinic. It should also state who should pay medical facilities with which participated and ensure the payment will be completed promptly. Dr. Tino added there is now more uncertainty, especially since the USC law indicates they would now have to negotiate their contracts with the local government units instead of previously with the Philippine Health Insurance Corporation or PhilHealth. Do they have an existing contracting system? completed integration of the local health facilities of the government? They have yet to answer this, so we don't know what will happen as of this time. The PhilHealth, to note, is currently in the process of beefing up its workforce in preparation for the surge in the number of clients. This is now undergoing study by the consultant of the GCG, or the Governance Commission for Government-Owned and Controlled Corporations. Their review on the additional employees is expected to be completed this year. The initiative, Del Rosario said, is also expected to allow their existing casual employees to finally become regular workers as stipulated in the UHC Act. According to Del Rosario, as of July, an initial 128 new plantilla positions have been granted to PhilHealth's legal and investigation department. The PhilHealth is currently bracing for the expected increase in the number of its monthly clients, which is expected to double from 1 million to 2 million with the full implementation of the universal health care law. While the IRR for the USC law is being finalized, a report said Filipinos could experience even more expensive healthcare costs this year on the back of more expensive medicines and medical services. In a Benefits 2019 Medical Trends Around the World report, medical inflation in the Philippines is expected to increase to 13.7% in 2019 from 13% in 2018. This will make the Philippines the second most expensive country in terms of medical expenses in Southeast Asia. Vietnam currently has the highest medical cost in the region at 14.2% this year, lower than the 14.5% in 2018. The gap between medical inflation and actual inflation continues in the Philippines. Companies must make employer-sponsored medical plans competitive and prioritize solutions that will provide quality health care in the long term. Medical costs are bound to continue increasing and will even outpace inflation by close to three times this year, and even higher in 2020, the report said. The report added that healthcare is becoming more expensive due to high-cost pharmaceuticals, new diagnostics and procedures, and overprescribing of low-value health tests and procedures. Globally, the top three health risk factors influencing medical costs are still metabolic and cardiovascular risk, dietary risk, and emotional or mental risk. However, on a regional level, there is a variation in the top risk factors. For Asia, environmental risk, which account for 52% of risk factors, are causing more citizens to spend more for health care. A pharmaceutical firm's report said poor health in the region is being caused by the ill effects of high pollution levels, specifically in many of the region's major cities. The report showed a significant increase in the incidence of respiratory diseases 
gastrointestinal diseases, and those of the circulatory system. This report surveyed 204 insurers across 59 countries. It assessed how health conditions, supplier factors, and consumer habits are driving costs, as well as providing insights into how insurers are responding. In response, the report said the number of insurers investing in initiatives to enable quality-focused care to better guide members to the right care options for them more quickly has more than doubled. Globally, 29% now name this type of investment as a top strategic priority. A pharmaceutical firm said insurers are responding by helping members make smarter healthcare choices with 63% of insurers providing education, tools, and incentives to drive positive behavior. The Middle East and Africa had the highest rate of adoption of programs of this type, with 71% of insurers proactively using such consumer-focused tactics with planned members. Globally, 78% are now considering or already support virtual health consultations. It is clear that health is a business imperative. Supporting and nurturing the physical, emotional, financial, and social well-being needs of employees return many benefits to businesses. With the future of work demanding a healthy and engaging environment for employees, it is critical that companies assess how medical plans can be reviewed through both cost optimization and employee engagement lenses. Based on the Philippine National Health Accounts, Total health expenditures at current prices grew 8% in 2017 to about 712 billion pesos from nearly 660 billion pesos in 2016. That means every Filipino spent 6,791 pesos for health care needs in 2017, or a 6.3% growth from 6,389 pesos in 2016. In real terms, per capita health expenditure of Filipinos amounted to 6,090 pesos which is an 8.1% growth from the 5,894 pesos they spent in 2016. Household out-of-pocket payment posted 372.8 billion pesos, or 54.5% of current health expenditures in 2017. This was followed by government schemes and compulsory contributory health care financing schemes at 225.9 billion pesos, or 33%. Voluntary health care payment schemes contributed 85.7 billion pesos or 12.5%. More than half of out-of-pocket payment amounting to 186.6 billion pesos or 50.1% went to pharmacies. Private general hospitals came in second at 97.5 billion or 26.1%. This was followed by providers of ambulatory health care at 50.3 billion or 13.5%. For Dr. Polycarp Jehoves, the issue is on the IRR's provision, which demands salaries for medical workers competitive with that of their public sector counterparts, as a condition for private sector medical facilities to be accredited by the Department of Health. This will force the private sector to raise the salary of its employees. He noted this will be unsustainable for the private sector in the long run, which he said is made worse by a no-balance billing policy of the government that bans hospitals from collecting direct medical expenses from patients for the duration of the confinement. The government and the private sector are not equal. In the government, their personal and electricity is paid for through taxes. In the private sector, all wages and utilities are paid by the patients. If implemented, he said the policy will lead to the closure of many medium-sized hospitals, leaving patients with poorer medical services. Both Dr. Tino and Dr. Hoves appealed to the government to provide the private sector with certain incentives to effectively participate in the implementation of the universal health care law. The government should be able to provide for everything in the implementation of the universal health care law, but for now, it is putting some burden of the implementation to the private sector. That is why they should not marginalize us in the drafting of the implementing rules and regulations. Thank you for listening to the Business Mirror Podcast. For a broader look on business, follow us on Facebook and Twitter at Business Mirror. Until next time.